Stupid council sending me to some stupid desert. I've got sand in every crack imagined. Oh, that was quite gone right. Yeah, word began to spread of a game called Star Wars 1313. The promising Uncharted-esque bounty hunter tale that placed the mysterious game's lead on a journey into Coruscant. 1313 is this location beneath the surface of Coruscant, and it's where the criminal underworld in Star Wars Galaxy lives. Every demo reel and bit of gameplay information led to rabid speculation and anticipation from fans and critics alike. A gritty look at Boba Fett's rise as a bounty hunter. And here we are, one of the most anticipated games of E3, and we just learned about it recently. It's Star Wars 1313. With an impressive gameplay reveal at E3 2012. It was possibly the most anticipated Star Wars game of all time. Star Wars 1313 attracted me because it seemed like a great, gritty, and for lack of a better word, visceral Star Wars game. There are literally hundreds of fans who have emailed me over the years talking about this particular game. We all waited for it, and then it was suddenly gone. Star Wars 1313. Oh man, we have, we have not seen anything about that in a while. The future of Star Wars 1313, which was the forthcoming third-person shooter, which was actually looking not dreadful, is rather uncertain. Many people believe that Visceral Games could be using a lot of the assets and materials from this game and using it for their new franchise. The team was intended to be an interesting no, expansion to the Star Wars saga, saga and I know it's Star Wars 13. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Star Wars feels like it's based on a singular question. What if? What if we took a typical fantasy story with knights and princesses and put it in space? What if we retold the hero's journey in a grand sci-fi opera? What if the moon was actually a gun? What if we put Bigfoot in the movie? Or a yeti? Welcome to the Himalaya! What if instead of swords, they have laser swords? Will what it blend? Land? Well, what if it could? What if Gungans were Goongas? Or what if I could be a bounty hunter? Not yet, buddy. Since the Empire's been striking back, Star Wars fans have been enamored with one character whose mystique, screen presence, and coolness outshone everyone else in the film. There you go, buddy. The man said like four words, but that was all it took. His design and aura was just captivating. He was so awesome that he was able to will himself into changing races. From his armor alone, you could tell that this man had been places and disintegrated faces. Even the concept art for his suit inspired Obi-Wan to pursue a life of scum and getting need in the younglings. But the mystery was all that we knew. And long before the Disney era of Star Wars, fans have been clamoring to fill in the blanks of Boba. Because Boba represented a side of Star Wars that was always there, but never fully explored. The gritty realism. The violence. The Riz. What if this fantasy space world was more... dirty? In the history of Star Wars, one attempt to explore this darker side shone brighter than the rest. Its symbols, though long faded, still evoke memories of... what if. It's a story of heartbreak, love, uncertainty, and most importantly, hope. A story that was decades in the making. It's... Hum, da, dum, hum. Kids are dumb. What? For as much as we love them, they can say some stupid things. Has someone erased it from the archive memory? They do stupid things. Sometimes they can be hard to work with. Peruska? Cut, let's try it again. And kids have different interests than adults. Usually. The older you get, the more you yearn for media that tickles your brain, not melt it. I can't watch anymore. No one likes to be talked down to. And for better or for worse, Star Wars has always been a franchise for all ages. The original trilogy was a masterclass in towing the line between appealing to kids and adults. The story was compelling enough for adults to invest in, and simple enough for kids to follow. The action and visuals were gripping while being fantastical enough to not traumatize a child, barring a few exceptions. A guy could get shot, but it's okay, mom. It's just a laser, so no blood. See, he's just taking a nap. And still, it felt like there were kernels of something far darker lurking underneath the world of Star Wars. With brief glimpses of this, like the Mos Eisley Cantina, the Bounty Hunters, and Jabba's Palace. Except they were nothing more than that. 
glimpses. The kids that grew up watching the original trilogy made the deadly mistake of getting old, and before the prequel trilogy, an older Star Wars fan that wanted an adult story had to rewatch the same three movies or delve into the insanity that was the EU. Except by the end of the original trilogy, some problems had reared their head, which culminated with the release of Star Wars: The Phantom Menace was the Star Wars from the late 90s and 2000s was in what I like to call its "Mom, get out of my room" era. The franchise was experiencing some weird changes, as the whole idea of it's a story for kids and enjoyed by adults too, was really put to the test. Oh. Whereas the original trilogy towed the line, many felt that the prequels were using that line as a lasso. The entire story of the prequels was already a much more complex endeavor than its predecessors. Gone were the days of the hero's journey, and Hello there. to there are heroes on both sides. Ooh, we salute you Wat Tambor, galactic hero. Episode 1 was infamously hated partially because it felt kidified. There was a talking rabbit stepping in poo poo hogging the screen time. One of the main characters was a little kid cracking jokes in the middle of a war zone. I'll try spinning, that's a good trick. They even hit poor Greedo with the baby ray. And for as much as the prequels tried to appeal to children, they were just as paradoxically adult. The same happy-go-lucky kid screaming Yippee! has a literal bomb inside of him controlled by a flying duck man. It's a my old slave detonator. I wonder if it's still functional. The prequels would lean into this darker side too as the trilogy progressed. Episode 1 had a bunch of children and older audiences didn't like that? Well how about we make the only child in Episode 3 with a spoken line of dialogue f***ing die? Needless to mention, the other acts like cold-blooded murder of non-combatants, decapitations, burning man, domestic violence, the worst sound ever recorded, elder abuse, political assassinations, actual assassinations, cold-blooded murder pod racer and hang on for the race of your life. I mean, there was a character named Sleaze Bagano. Like, come on, what are we doing here? The dark turn of Anakin represented a turn for the franchise as a whole, as it showed glimmers of that grisly core bubbling beneath, still desperate to fully break free, but was still bound by decades of audience and directorial expectations. As dark as the prequels went, this taste of a more mature story in Star Wars was washed away, as the theatrical follow-up to Revenge of the Sith was the Clone Wars movie which was not what adults were looking for, and the early seasons of the Clone Wars show was still very much marketed towards children, with many adults skeptical of its quality, given that Obi-Wan's beard was the most Lego bricked up it's ever been. The Star Wars games, though, understood this market very well, with many prequel era games attempting to break that bubble by showing a different side of the franchise. Republic Commando put the war in Star Wars. KOTOR attempted to place the player in the shoes of a Sith, which were very dirty and kinda off-brand, and a little stinky. Battlefront 2 chronicled the hardships of military service with genuinely compelling writing. I remember about the- Yeah, yeah, we all know that one. Thank you. And one game even came close to answering the question of, what if I could be Boba Fett? Just make his first name this and make the D silent and close enough, right? No. The prequels aged and so did their games. As the 2000s marched on, the tone and quality of Star Wars games were a mixed bag. For every Force Unleashed, there were three Star Wars The Clone Wars lightsaber duels, or Star Wars Ask Yoda for mobile phone. Yoda, why can't I get a girlfriend? Size matters, small you are. You, Yoda. The actualization of a more mature Star Wars game was few and far between. The days of playing as a Jedi Stormtrooper soon faded into relics of a bygone era. Except for one more game that would change everything. By 2010, two things had become abundantly clear. People wanted an adult Star Wars story that wasn't this, and they wanted a story with no Jedi. Games like The Force Unleashed had skipped jumping the shark altogether, and instead yanked that shark in a slow, clunky, downwards motion. And its sequel was not much better. They were fun, but in an over-the-top fanfiction kind of way, which really pushed the limits of what the audience's suspension of disbelief could be. What the hell am I looking at? Jedi and lightsabers were all we saw in the movies. It felt like a majority of the games. It was time for a change. Like, Jedi. I hate Jedi. You know how much what, what I'd rather do is shoot people with lasers. 
So George Lucas saw this adult market ripe for the taking, and he says, Let's make a Star Wars TV show for adults. His words, not mine. And he begins cooking. Lucas had concocted a show that would finally address that seedy underworld. So he called this show Star Wars Underworld. Fitting title, I guess. This show would have everything Star Wars fans have been craving. It would focus on the crime-ridden underworld of Coruscant. Interesting. It would tell a more mature story. Fabulous. That's great. It would bridge the gap between episode 3 and 4. And at the time, this wasn't an oversaturated era like it is now, where it feels like every Star Wars show is... I'll have a... Star Wars show set between episode 3 and 4. How original. And with extra... Desert Planet. Daring today, aren't we? Producer Rick McCallum would go on to describe the show as... So dense. Oh, every wrong one, sorry. It's going to be much darker and grittier. It's finally happening. Yes! I've been looking forward to this. Finally. Finally. Behind the scenes, however, the actual production was another story. Lucas wanted to push the limits of what this show would look like. Because for as talented a filmmaker Lucas is, his later projects were affected by one desire above all. That special effects reign supreme. Movies, games, TV shows, it didn't matter. If it appeared on a screen, it was going to look like a movie. By using technology like real-time rendering and a green screen, the Underworld team achieved visuals that looked stunning for a TV show of its time. And after seeing the incredible visual fidelity of Underworld, Lucas went ham. Let's add some more cities here. Let's add a jetpack. Let's add more characters. Let's make the city even bigger. Let's... Yeah, well, all these changes cost money. A lot of money. And no money means no animation! Despite a 2009 release date, the show was scrapped as production costs grew to insane heights. From the remnants of Star Wars Underworld laid a shred of hope, a video game that Lucas had originally intended as a tie-in to the show. Now with no show to tie into, this fledgling concept morphed into one of LucasArts' biggest endeavors to date. Star Wars 1313 was going to take all that Jedi business and throw it in the trash. trash. Say goodbye to lightsabers, the Force, and bathrobes, and get used to gadgets and gizmos. You want a Force jump? We don't do that here. Take the parkour route like a normal person. Instead of being some morally infallible, asexual monk settling a tax issue or something, this game would put the player in the shoes of a low-life scumbag. A real sleaze bagano, if you will. Star Wars 1313 was going to be dark. Literally. The game would have you explore the deepest depths of the Coruscant underworld, where crime was the status quo. Honey, you've got a big storm coming. Seeing as 1313 would avoid any Jedi business, the gameplay had to reflect what a normal person was capable of. To do this, LucasArts developed the game using the tried and true shopping cart method. A little Gears of War? Toss that in. Some Bounty Hunter? Sure, I got a coupon. Uncharted? No, Timmy, put it back. We can't afford name brand. Unless... Stay on it! I'll catch up! The gameplay was truly a grab bag of gaming staples of the time. And seeing as the newest Star Wars games coming out during 1313's development were this and this, the team behind 1313 knew they had a home run on their hands. The only thing left to do now was to start Strike. swinging. Strike. In 2011, they signed a deal with Unreal to use their engine in the upcoming game. The fans' eyebrows raised ever so slightly. Unreal Engine, you say? A lot of great-looking games run on that engine. A trademark is filed a year later for the name Star Wars 1313. LucasArts just what are you cooking? A demo at E3 2012, the first look at this mysterious new game. Deep breath in, and out. Remember boys, no hype until gameplay is shown. Alright, this looks pretty That's good. Deep the Jedi are doing their thing elsewhere. Right, they have no business on 1313. No, no, this is a much nice. more grounded and relevant. Oh, oh my god, Star Wars! Star Wars! This game was out of left field. A surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. And the more the devs talked about the game, the more older fans felt like they were finally scratching that itch. But that's not all. These guys were also nerds like us, and really cared about making an authentic Star Wars experience. Their booth at E3 even had you descend down into the underworld of Coruscant. 
They also handed out these little nifty USB drives and postcards with some more blurbs about the game, to really make you feel like Princess Leia. One thing everyone could agree on too was that this game looked incredible. How? Even Jeff Keighley could barely contain his excitement. Wow. This guy straight up said to the developers, Address the issue that this game looks obscenely good. <laughs> it was a sentiment shared by everyone. The game looked like it was actually made by a computer in Star Wars. These graphics were on par, if not outclassing its contemporaries. At the same E3, IGN would get an exclusive behind the scenes look at the game and sung of its praises even further. Very like Uncharted like gameplay. He was running through a marketplace, Boba Fett's chasing a mark. Everything's like connected. And it was really cool too because like he had like move coming to an obstacle and you like run up to it and slide underneath it. He was nimble and agile and like acrobatic in a lot of ways. Now granted, this was only a demo and not technically a true showing of the entire game, but this was 2012, people were not as jaded yet. We were still buying Dead Island and Watch Dogs because of the trailers, okay? But remember that 1313 was being made by LucasArts after all, and much like the man for which they're named, they wanted to make this game look like a movie. But how can you make a video game look like a movie? Have some guy randomly squeeze by you to go pee in the middle of it? Sorry. Close. You recruit the movie makers. Lucky for LucasArts, they just so happen to have direct access to one of the premier special effects studios in the world. In the same building. So LucasArts called up their buddies at ILM. Oh. We're making a Star Wars game. <laughs> yes, yeah, so. Wait! It's dark and gritty. I'm on my way. They recruited Skywalker Sounds to do the sounds. And now Lucas Films was involved too. This once humble spin-off was now becoming a veritable confederacy of creators within the Star Wars franchise itself. Only this confederacy would actually succeed. As development progressed, their work became industry defining. ILM had just finished their work on the Avengers animating Hulk's chest hair, and then flipped that same technology into Star Wars 1313, reworking technology that had only previously been in the movies. Just as they pushed the boundaries of CGI back in the prequels with Grievous's succulent eye juices, ILM was going to do it again for another medium. The graphics were looking so good that there were talks at Lucasfilms at adapting more video game development techniques into future films. Of course, the game developers were impressed to say the least. Wow. However, graphics are icing on the cake. Yeah, the icing tastes good, but that doesn't matter if the rest of my cake tastes like sh**. What really matters when making a game is that it feels just like that. A game. If it's not fun, then I'm done. So while these graphics were stellar eye candy, what fans really cared about was the story and gameplay. Which is funny that for as graphics-obsessed gamers were back then, the most exciting visual was a simple letter. Star Wars 1313 was going to be rated M. Not Houtini, but M. And there it is. The Grand Slam LucasArts had been waiting for. This game's selling point. It's rated M. The fact that this game was going to be literally and figuratively mature was all people could talk about. This dark and grittier version of Star Wars. By the time we put um, something more mature. A mature experience. Dark, mature. Dark, gritty. Mature, 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 dark. Maturity. The game's website is so mature you gotta verify your age to get in. Since the game's reveal in June of 2012, the hype was at an all-time high. A single scrap of information could set off a chain reaction, consuming the entire fanbase. It was headlining magazines, and lauded by Star Wars publications. Need I also mention that The Clone Wars had recently aired an episode about a young Boba Fett's bounty hunting adventures, and he sounds like he's 13. Coincidence? I think not! Now rumors were circulating that this game could be about the legendary bounty hunter himself. Salacious B. Cry. Your Highness, if Boba Fett is in the game, surely the hype levels will reach critical mass. You must understand this. Miss I don't think so. Check out this leaked concept art. Frillin heck. Activate hype. You may fire when ready. I've been looking forward to this. It also had the Beyblade guy from Clone Wars who speaks like he works at a Wendy's drive-thru. The anticipation was getting insane. Someone better get me a moisture evaporator because my pants are soaked now. This was the game that was surely promised to bring us balance to the Force. Bridge the gap between the dark and the light. LucasArts, give us more. And then there was silence. A deafening silence. LucasArts had gone radio dark. The last official update being a trailer in August of 2012, but it essentially replayed the demo with some Inception-esque editing. There was nothing. 
for months. The fans began to worry, and they would reach out to LucasArts. You guys got any updates on 1313? Everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? Not good, Harrison. Not good. This is outrageous. We demand updates. See. But what about the story? See. Mm. All right, I'm getting my laptop. Let's check the official website. Star Wars 1313 is a game about being a bounty hunter in the most dangerous place in the galaxy. Refresh. Star Wars 1313 is a game about being a bounty hunter. Star Wars 1313 is a game about being so dense. Every oh, single image quick. has so much. The lack of information was unbearable. They didn't even announce what platform the game was going to be on. In this drought, people sought answers from a mysterious land far, far away. Germany. Apparently there had been a German Facebook page that obtained leaked photos of the game, which just made perfect sense. It was 2013. Allegedly it was coming out for the PlayStation 3, and there were 31 photos. Well, 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 well. That's six wells. But this was quickly dismissed by Sony. The fans were getting done almost as dirty as that one overweight pilot being called Porkins. That's it, LucasArts. I'm busting down the door and figuring this out once and for all. No. Disney's purchase of Star Wars in October 2012 BBY was quiet, as if dozens of projects had cried out and silenced in an instant. For all their fanfare and praise shouted from the rooftops, the games met their end with a hushed, melancholic march towards obscurity. A total massacre. Only one beating heart still remained, clinging to life with a slow, rhythmic pulse, fleeting, but beating. In the middle of 1313's development, Star Wars had entered a bright new future as the newest notch under Disney's belt. Because for as much hate as George Lucas's prequel trilogy received, and his quote-unquote destruction of childhoods, no one ever questioned that Star Wars was Lucas's baby. Hey, these are my kids. So all those Star Wars films. All the Star Wars films. They were your kids. Yeah, well they are my, you know, I I loved them, I created them. He had made his money twice over. Left his mark on the industry. But the idea of making more Star Wars for a father pushing 70 was a lot. And the response from his recent trilogy didn't help either. As much as he wanted to be part of Star Wars, I think he questioned if Star Wars still wanted him. For years, everyone speculated that it would take a massive external pressure for Lucas to pass the Star Wars torch. Except for George Walton Lucas, the pressure had been internal for years. Perhaps not all was lost for Star Wars 1313 under this new regime. Maybe their explanation of the acquisition by media darling Bob Iger would quell our fears. Today, I am proud to announce the Walt Disney Company yeah, blah, 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 blah. to one of the greatest family franchises ever. No, no. George Lucas is a true visionary. Um, I thought Count Dooku was visionary. Fans can expect a new feature film, Star Wars Episode 7, in theaters worldwide in 2015. Yes! And there will be more feature films, games. Oh, okay. Maybe it's still alive. George! I've been a big fan of Disney all my life. Uh, you know, from, you know, from first day at Disneyland, same time feel completely confident that Disney, uh, you know, will take good care of the franchise I've built. Well, that was kind of reassuring. While many of LucasArts' projects were given the goofy band hammer, 1313 was miraculously unscathed by the acquisition. As far as the average consumer was concerned, things were still smooth sailing for the game. The only thing that would change now is maybe there's a Disney logo on the box and like a hidden Mickey or something, I don't know. Kathleen Kennedy even said the concept was gold. Within LucasArts, though, a new tide was rolling in. Disney wanted to focus more on licensing the Star Wars trademark, rather than create their own games in-house with the mouse. Which made sense, seeing as their own studios bled money. Well. Disney had also just spent enough money to legitimately purchase multiple small nations. On a franchise about children getting abducted by grown men and calling them master. So yeah, let's recoup some losses. And the way to do that is to minimize expenses and reduce your risks. Unfortunately, 1313 was too expensive and it was too risky. Its time had come. 13. 13, you have been replaced by Tiny Death Star for Android and iOS. In April of 2013, 
Star Wars 1313, and virtually the whole team at LucasArts had been let go. There were those that reacted to this news like a true Jedi. Oh, Star Wars 1313, rest in peace. Uh, we loved you while we had you, and it was oh. all too short a time. While others embraced the dark side. Kathleen Kennedy, the f do you need to f oh. meddling around with my god video games? The cancellation of this game was truly a watershed moment for the Star Wars community. Such promise, such maturity, such Boba Fett gone in an instant. Amidst the chaos, a subset of the most loyal 1313 fans had taken refuge in dark space. These remnants refused to accept the loss. They would create petitions begging Disney to finish the fight. An admirable effort, but a petition ain't gonna do poodoo. Sir, would you care to sign our petition? Uh, I support and oppose many things, but not strong enough to pick up a pen. They combed over any minute detail of production leaking as a sign the game was still alive. Some screenshots leaked? Activate copium detonators. And no sign was bigger than the news that Visceral Games would be picking up the pieces of 1313. Visceral Games? Didn't they make Dead Space? Well, curb stopping an Ewok does sound appealing. Alright, Visceral. Help us. You're our only- We should have known better. Real ones know that Star Wars already has a dead space. None of this would really matter though, because the trademark was officially abandoned a few years after its cancellation, barring a few teases by former devs, some leaks here and there, and a 2016 Game of the Year nod from Geek.com, the game was deader than Anakin's Johnson post Mustafar. The death of 1313 was the final straw. That dark and mature feeling that had been brewing underneath Star Wars for so long had reached critical mass. Only it wouldn't be Star Wars that would implode, but the fans. They magnetized all their hate towards Disney. It was all your fault, Disney. You took it from me. I hate you. It was a good friend, Disney. This has been the narrative surrounding 1313 since its cancellation over a decade ago. While it still pains me to see what could have been, and we were all justifiably hurt, to finish the story with such a clear-cut ending would paint an incomplete picture. A picture of a definitive and absolute truth. And we know what Obi-Wan says about absolutes. I'm going to f count Dooku. What? Making a video game is a lot like raising a child. Even if every condition is perfect, there's always going to be a few road bumps. And they cost a shit ton of money. Crunch time, disagreements, and scrapping ideas are a near guarantee for any game. And the problems for LucasArts had existed long before George signed the dotted line. Since the 90s, LucasArts suffered from excessive crunch time on many of their projects. Crunch is to be expected though, and is usually manageable with the right leadership. Which they didn't have. By the early 2000s, LucasArts' leadership had slowly eroded. Not necessarily from poor quality, but excessive quantity. Every two to three years, there would be a new CEO or higher up. With every new CEO came new changes to the company. New protocols, new teams, new company culture. One LucasArts employee would even describe the company as a revolving door of CEOs. So imagine you've been working for months with a brand new team, taking weeks to establish a rapport with one another through the most agonizing corporate icebreakers imaginable. All right, guys, can we go ahead and have cameras on? If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Okay, we'll come back to that. And once your team has finally hit their stride, a new boss tells you to dump everything. Everything? Everything. And you have to start from square one again. Even if you did manage to complete a game, there was a very real chance that management would just axe the project altogether for frustratingly vague reasons. This happened at LucasArts way more than it should have, and it made work a bureaucratic nightmare. With the advent of every new CEO also came budget setbacks, which is corporate code for best start updating your LinkedIn. The idea of who is an essential worker was also goalposted constantly, and the development teams gradually shrank. To the point where by the mid-2000s, LucasArts had basically axed their entire QA department. Probably not the best idea considering that they ensure the quality of your product. Oh, and remember when LucasArts went radio silent for a few months? Of course. Thanks. Well, that was because they instituted a hiring freeze and halted production of 1313, as the higher-ups were in talks with Disney and wanted to see how the deal would turn out. So that whole this game is still alive? Oh, I lied. These difficulties with upper management compounded the fact that more Star Wars games were licensed out for a quick buck, and this hyper-focus on Star Wars gradually pushed out more and more talent, which led to games that could have sold well getting the Uncle Owen in on Peru treatment. LucasArts needed a game that would dig them out of this hole, 
something that required little effort with an easy payout, or a grandiose epic that would define a generation. So they chose to make an MMO. The Old Republic was great, don't get me wrong, but MMOs require a massive financial support to eventually turn a profit, the kind of support that LucasArts simply couldn't provide. And all of this was merely the backdrop to 1313's upbringing, as the actual development of the game itself was a whole nother can of Exegorths. Much like a deaf sprinter, the problems were at the start. You hear that? By the time 1313 was conceptualized, the number of staff at LucasArts had plummeted, with Kotaku straight up asking them if they even have enough people to work on the game. You do not have a staff. In its earliest stages, 1313 was conceived as an underworld tie-in, except what that game would play like was up in the air. At one point, it was envisioned as a GTA-style game. Scratch that, let's make it a co-op shooter. Scratch that, let's make it Gears of War. Scratch that, let's make it Uncharted. Now, I'm not something of a scientist myself, but it doesn't take a cinetine to see that these are all dramatically different experiences to develop. LucasArts would find the best of all genres, though, and combine them into a glorious amalgamation. But this ate up development time and timing was not on their side either. The game was in production at the genesis of a new console generation, and the expectation was that this game would appear on both, further adding to LucasArts' workload. This meant that 1313 didn't just have to look passable, it had to look next-generation good. Ergo, use cutting-edge movie technology from your cutting-edge movie studio. A good idea in theory and in limited tech demos, but more difficult to integrate into a full-fledged game. Sorry, my face is tired from that also needs to run on my PS4 and my 360 on life support. The technology needed to achieve that graphical fidelity was expensive too, further tightening the budget and scope. The project's creative director would even describe this technology as a bit of a double-edged laser sword. It can be really daunting. Uh, it's a very shiny object to kind of have next to you guys, you know, next to us while we're, while we're building the game. The awesome thing has been how liberating it is from a gameplay perspective. Some insider sources at LucasArts even said the technology was simply incompatible altogether. If all of this managerial and development instability wasn't bad enough, 1313 would periodically get drastic overhauls from God. And by that I mean George Lucas would roll up to the studio and say, Hmm, what if it had Yoda or something? Which would completely derail development. While Lucas might consume the succulent food court meals like a true gamer, he didn't know how games were made. There were numerous examples of Lucas providing suggestions on what 1313 should add. Except if you're a regular old Joe Schmo developer and George f***ing Lucas walks into your office, you're not going to brush that off. Lucas's reputation and decades of success made it very difficult for people to tell him, mm, no, that's, that's stupid. He's also a notorious perfectionist, wanting all of his projects to be the absolute best according to his vision. Which is why you have movies from the 1970s with CGI of the 90s, and whatever the f*** this is. Infamously, 1313 was developed without Boba Fett ever in mind. It wasn't until Lucas said, Add Boba Fett, that the entire story was reworked to revolve around him. These changes happened constantly, and they were often kept away from the public eye. Sorry. By the time of E3 2012, the developers knew that Boba was going to be the main character. But for some reason, the team was told to keep that information under wraps. Um, can I be Boba Fett? Uh... Well, actually, Boba is going to be the main character. Oh. I can only assume that they were told to omit Boba's inclusion to maintain some big plot twist or something. And while I appreciate the effort, your company kind of needs money, and slapping Boba Fett on the marketing would incinerate $60 from my wallet. It was like LucasArts were barreling towards a concrete wall, and management's solution was to fire the brakes department. Might I also add that the task of creating a Star Wars game comes with its own expectations as well, because Star Wars fans take Star Wars very seriously. This is where the fun begins. And when the franchise missteps, they will let you know. No one loves or hates Star Wars as much as Star Wars fans. So if you're going to inscribe your name into this cherished franchise, you better do it right. Which is exactly what the 1313 team did. They managed to show a product that precisely pinpointed every last wish the fans had yearned for. A feat that was achieved on a very shaky foundation. In an ironic twist of fate, the very game that brought LucasArts together would come to be their biggest disappointment. It's like a really sad story, I don't know what you'd call that. Even when Disney stepped in and halted Stop. production, there was still much work left to be done on the project. Work that had to be completed in spite of all the previous factors I discussed. Some who worked on the project placed the blame solely on Disney, 
while others' experiences weave a more complex narrative. I think a fitting comparison to bookend this game's life would be to think about 1313's development as a coin toss of sorts, with enough development, management, and financial doubts to garner concerns that this game could even get made without a Disney buyout, but just enough expertise and love for the game to make completing it a tangible reality. And right as the coin was about to land, an oversized mouse-like glove caught it first. Which they put it all on black, baby! Let's go, come on, let's roll the dice. Star Wars 1313 was not the first of its kind, nor the last. But the seeds this game planted would bloom soon enough. Fitting, seeing as the franchise started on hope. The stories this game drew inspiration from, and would subsequently inspire, bear a striking resemblance to the tales we've craved since 1977. It feels almost purposeful. I mean, George Lucas has always said that Star Wars is... Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. We love to mourn the death of Star Wars 1313, bitterly lamenting in our heads over and over. What if? The truth is, though, that 1313 has been here the whole time because no one's ever really gone. <laughs> this push for a dark and more mature take on Star Wars has manifested across multiple mediums now. Not long after 1313's cancellation, Rogue One was released, which took a more grounded approach towards the Galactic Civil War. And they all die in the end. Solo would adopt this same approach somewhat by showing off the most intense and realistic warfare I've ever seen in a Star Wars film. Andor tackled Star Wars with compelling and mature writing. The Clone Wars is widely regarded to have hit its stride once they shed the more child-friendly arcs and fully committed to even more on-screen war crimes. Ahsoka even goes down to the same platform as the trailer onto one of the best repair shops on 1313. Okay, that one just stings a little bit, actually. If Boba Fett wouldn't get to go to level 1313, at least his dad would in the comics. Adventurous. Look at the concept art for Star Wars 1313, and tell me you don't see the obvious inspiration behind The Mandalorian, a show which was also praised in its earlier seasons for being a more realistic and mature take on Star Wars. And even beyond inspiration, in a much more literal sense, 1313 directly impacted the creation of The Mandalorian, as a lot of the same technology ILM implemented into 1313 was later repurposed for the show. There's entire fan-made revivals of the trailer, custom action figures, fantastic mods. A lot of the gameplay was later used in the Jedi games. I mean, Jedi Survivor's opening scene is Cal in the underworld of Coruscant. At the end of 1313's story, there's still one question that lingers in the back of my mind. One question that I know was at the forefront of everyone's minds who worked on the game. What if we made the best game we could?